Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Laura Cohen, and I'm the Executive Director of the Harriet and Kenneth Kupferberg Holocaust Center at Queensborough Community College at the City University of New York. Our mission is to use the lessons of the Holocaust to educate current and future generations about the ramifications of prejudice, racism, and stereotyping. Today's event is entitled Narrating Srebrenica, Conducting Oral Histories with Genocide Survivors, and features three special guests. Hassan Hassanovich, head of the Oral History Project at the Srebrenica Genocide Memorial, and himself a survivor. Anne Petrilla, prof professor of the practice and coordinator of global initiatives at the University of Denver's Graduate School of Social Work. And Dr. Selma Leidestorf, professor of oral history and culture at the University of Amsterdam. It's a conversation that was inspired by Anne and Hassan, both of whom I've met first over a decade ago, and who are two of the people most dear to me in this world. This program is presented in partnership with the Harriman Institute at Columbia University, the Sam and Francis Freed Genocide and Holocaust Academy at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, the Center for the Study of Genocide and Human Rights at Rutgers University, the Holocaust Genocide and Interfaith Education Center at Manhattan College, and the Nancy and David Wolf Holocaust and Humanity Center. I'd also like to take a moment to remember Haira Chacic, who passed away last week. Haira led the Women of Srebrenica Association and fought tirelessly, tirelessly to make sure that the authorities continued searching for all of the missing men and boys who were murdered during the Srebrenica genocide. She held steadfast in her belief that one day the mortal remains of her son Nino would be found so that she could bury him alongside his father Yunus at the cemetery in Potichari. That tragically didn't happen and Nino, along with a thousand other souls, still remain missing 26 years later. Now, before we begin, I'd like to give you a brief overview of the events leading up to the genocide. The 1992 to 1995 Bosnian War has its roots in the collapse of what was known as the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia under its then president, President Josip Broz Tito, during the economic crisis of the late 1970s. Prior to his death in 1980, Tito had already begun the process of decentralizing federal authority to each of the socialist republics, including Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia, Bosnia, Macedonia, and Montenegro. Around that time, Serbia began jostling for control of Yugoslavia. But still an integrated socio-cultural climate continued to exist within Bosnia up until Serbian and Bosnian Serb ethno-nationalist ethno rhetoric entered the discourse in the late 1980s, early 1990s. In 1991, Slovenia became the first republic to secede, erupting in a brief 10-day war with Serbia. Croatia followed suit and fought Serbia in a ferocious four-year war. And even though intermittent hostilities had already begun, the Bosnian War formally began on April 6, 1992, just a single day before the EU recognized the country's independence. The Drina Valley in Eastern Bosnia, bordering Serbia, is where the Bosnian Serb army and associated militias began their ethnic cleansing campaign in early 1991. The picture you are looking at is one of the execution sites in Kozluk, where a mass grave of over 805 men and boys were found, including Hassan's brother and Haida's husband. The region was formerly home to 37,000 residents of mixed ethnicities, with a majority of Bosnian Muslim, also known as Bosniak, inhabitants. In the Srebrenica municipality, 296 villages were ethnically cleansed during the first three months of the war. In 1993, the Srebrenica enclave was declared one of six safe areas by United Nations Resolutions 819 and 824. On July 11, 1995, Srebrenica, under the protection of the Dutch UN peacekeepers, also known as Dutch Bat, was overrun by the Bosnian Serb army. Approximately 20 to 25,000 re refugees had fled into the neighboring village of Potichari and gathered in the immediate areas surrounding the peacekeeping compound. Between five to 6,000 refugees, mostly women and girls, were allowed entry into the base, but eventually were expelled. The women and girls were forcibly bused to the free territory in Tuzla, while the men and boys were taken to nearby areas and murdered. The last time these families saw one another was on the highway in front of the peacekeeping compound, also known as the Battery Factory, where the Srebrenica Genocide Memorial is. Meanwhile, a separate column of approximately 10 to 15,000 Bosniak men and boys and a few women had fled into the mountains between July 11th and July 12th, 1995. While a small number of men were able to survive, including Hassan, this would later become known as the Death March, 
as over the next 11 days, over 8,000 Bosniak men and boys were executed by the Bosnian Serb army. The Srebrenica genocide is the single largest massacre to take place in Europe since World War II. The killings were formally declared genocide during the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia's case against Bosnian Serb Army Deputy General Radislav Krstić. In 2017, Rako Mladic, Bosnian Serb Army Colonel General, was found guilty of committing war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. And in 2019, Radovan Karadzic, the wartime president of the Republic of Srpska, was convicted of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes by the tribunal. The Dayton Peace Agreement ended the war on November 21st, 1995, and Bosnia became one state with two political entities, the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is a coalition of Bosniaks and Croats, and the Republic of Srpska governed by Bosnian Serbs. Srebrenica was assigned to the Republic of Srpska, the entity many survivors say was forged out of their blood. Bosnia is also a country with a tripartite presidency that includes one Bosniak, one Bosnian Serb and one Bosnian Croat representative, and the country has no less than 14 separate governments, the federal government, the two entity governments, 10 cantonal governments in the federation, and the self-governing city of Birchko. But let's be clear, the political situation in Bosnia is rapidly deteriorating as we speak. Just seven days ago, serious alarms were sounded. According to the Alliance for Peacebuilding, and I quote, the act of silencing the high representative Christian Schmidt at the United Nations Security Council represents a grave threat to the office of the high representative, an international institution responsible for overseeing the implementation of civilian aspects of the 1995 Dayton Peace Agreement. The alleged deal by the United States, the United Kingdom and France with the Russian Federation to extend the mandate of the NATO backed European Union force, also known as U4, resulted in the striking of all references to the Office of the High Representative in the resolution. Moreover, security and stability in Bosnia is spiraling amidst threats from Milorad Dodik, the Serb member of the Bosnian State Presidency, to reconstitute the Serb army and withdraw from state level institutions, including the National Army, end quote. So having said all that, I'd like to get things started and introduce my dear colleague and friend, Hassan Hasanovic, Hassan is the head of the Oral History Project at the Srebrenica Genocide Memorial, where he educates thousands of visitors each year. Hassan survived the genocide, but other families members of his did not, including his twin brother and father. He's a co-author with Anne Petrillo, who joins us today also, of Voices from Srebrenica, Survivor Narratives of the Bosnian Genocide. He is frequently interviewed by the international press, is a keynote speaker at events around the world, and his memoir, Surviving Srebrenica, has been translated into several languages. He has also addressed Scottish and Flemish Houses of Parliament, as well as had a private reception with the UK Prime Minister at the official office on 10 Downing Street. He's led numerous oral history projects, including with the Sarajevo War Childhood Museum and the Balkan Investigative Reporting Network. He's curated a video exhibition entitled Srebrenica Our Story at the Memorial and currently oversees the oral history collaboration with the Shoah Foundation. He is also a permanent member of the Srebrenica Peace March Organizing Committee, which is a 110 kilometer walk that commemorates the men and boys murdered during the death march. And now I turn it over to you, Hassan. First of all, let me thank you for organizing uh, this event uh, to make sure that we, that we uh, pass on this story to those who don't know and that we also raise awareness of, of, of the possible future, future um, genocides. Um, my name, my name is Hassan. Um, I was born um, in Serbia um, because my village was very close in, in, the Bos in, in Bosnia, uh, on the Bosnian territory, but uh, uh, nearest, uh, the nearest hospital was, was in, in Serbia. So my mother had to go there to give, give birth. Uh, I, I spent um, uh, around uh, uh, 16, 16 years uh, in my village uh, near River Drina, which is a, nat uh, a natural border with, with Serbia. Uh, it was a Muslim village uh, because villages were not mixed up. Uh, they, we had Serbs uh, living uh, in, in several villages near, nearby. Um, I remember those times during the, uh, the communism uh, or socialism, as we as we rather call it, 
Uh, it was a very peaceful time. We lived under the motto of brotherhood and unity. I felt like, like Yugoslav. Um, I even remember when Josip Broz Tito died, he was the president of, of, of country who was beloved president at the time. Um, and we, we, we never could never imagine that anything could go wrong. Um, it was uh, totally uh, forbidden to speak about the nationalism, about uh, any differences. Every, every, everyone was Yugoslav. Um, we had our um, Yugoslav identity. Um, people were, of course, struggling uh, in terms of economy, but people were, were happy. People were very happy in my village. We used to work on our fields. Uh, my father and my grandfather used to used to work in Croatia. They were constantly away, uh, but they were really making good living for for my family. We built two houses. Uh, uh, I really did enjoy my time in, in 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 my childhood in my village. I used to walk really really long distances to 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 my schools, uh, but. Uh, I never felt that it was uh, hard. Uh, I joined, I really did enjoy time, spending time with my friends, uh, walking through through a forest, uh, playing with animals, uh, playing different uh, games. Uh, I had my twin brother, uh, we wore the same clothes, we were all the time together. Um, I was really um, helping my neighbors uh, with my family. Sometimes it was tough to work in the fields because of, of, of hot summers, uh, but I really had to help my mother and my brothers as well because my grandmother was was was, was ill all the time, uh, almost. Uh, I was really very, very happy when my father came from Croatia from work, bring, bringing me some presents, but uh, I had to, you know, I did not, uh, uh, I was not looking, I was not, um, uh, you know, uh, waiting for a present, but I presents. I, I was just, you know, wanted to see him. Uh, you know, uh, when I was about to drop uh, of uh, to finish uh, my primary school, uh, those the, the situation started to change uh, dramatically. Um, we had first uh, elections, uh, then a referendum on independence of Bosnia. I moved to another city to continue my schooling. To go, I started to go to secondary school. So we we had to change the place of 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 of, of residence. Uh, we moved from from the village to the actual town, which was difficult for me to to adjust. So at the time, things started to change dramatically. The nationalism started to revive. Uh, people started to separate from one another in in Bratunas, where I moved. To uh, you could see that you know Muslims, Bosnians, just started to go to their own coffee bars, serves to their own. There were some fist fights uh, in, on television. You could see propaganda, especially coming from Milosevic, uh, and you could feel. I I felt that. Uh, 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 um, I felt that. Um, uh, we were being basically um, labeled as, as Muslims, as Bosnians, because of our religion, because of our identity. So uh, we knew that Serbs were hijacking the, the army, Yugoslav people's army. So we knew that if any war starts, that we have no chance to survive. Uh, and that was about to come. And it actually came uh, very, very, very uh, quickly. Um, a long story short, uh, I had to run from my home uh, with my family because we we we, we were uh, driven away from our, our home by by Serb forces. Um, they were Serb forces from Serbia who came to Bosnia to help the local uh, Serb rebels to to achieve uh, their plan. Uh, and uh, I ended up in Srebrenica. Uh, I spent for about three and a half years in Srebrenica. Uh, I lived under the, 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 the siege uh, with my family, um, my, my grandfather, my, my grandmother, my, my uncle, they all, all died uh, at, at the very beginning of the war. It was really tough. Uh, we were struggling with food. There was no food. Uh, it was a really, really uh, uh, terrible um, um, famine. Uh, hunger at uh, the time. Uh, 
but we just wanted to stay alive and we were still together as family. And then um, um, uh, in uh, March 93, we were, giving, uh, we were given a promise from, from the United Nations uh, representative, Philip Morion, the commander of, of the forces in Bosnia at the time. He came and he came to inspect the situation and he promised that we will be protected by the UN before the crowd. Uh, and um, then uh, he left um, before Srebrenica was proclaimed as, 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 as a safe human area. Uh, I survived the massacre at the playground where uh, uh, 74 teenagers were killed and over 100 were wounded. And uh, um, I, I, sat, I sat on one of the bleachers and uh, all the teenagers around me, me including my, my, my friends, were, were, were massacred. And um, I remained un, unwounded, not, not, I was not wounded. So that was big first trauma that I survived. So later I spent uh, a year and a half in Srebrenica uh, under the human protection. It was a little bit better. We had some food, food was, was, was being delivered. First they tried to drop food from the air, then it didn't work. Then they were trying to bring food through the roads. Uh, and uh, I even started going to school. Uh, there was no shelling at the time, no shooting. But that did not last for long. Unfortunately, in July 1995, Srebrenica was attacked again. There was uh, a renewal of hostilities. In spite of the um, uh, Dutch UN presence, uh, um, Srebrenica fell into the hands of the Bosnian Serb army. I had to run from Srebrenica. I had to say, I had to, I had to say goodbye to my mother, my my um, uh, younger brother, my grandparents uh, and they went to Potocari to the UN base hoping you know to be protected there uh, we did not have even time properly to, to, to say properly you know goodbye uh, to one another so I, I started walking with my twin brother with my uncle and my father so just uh, you know that first day uh, before we, we started to to set off um, the shooting started and I, lo I lost the sight of them and I never saw them ever again so I was on my own for six days, six nights, being hunted. Uh, I did not sleep, uh, did not have any food, did not. Eat. I had a big trouble finding water. I had some sugar that friend of my father gave me in his backpack before he before he decided to give him give himself up. So long story short, uh, uh, I was being hunted. Uh, I I was almost captured twice. I I ran away twice uh, from soldiers who I saw very closely who were shooting after me. I was constantly very scared and I was afraid of my life. I was 19, I was very skinny, young fed. I was constantly thinking of my family if I would ever, ever see them again. And on July 16th, I survived um, with uh, a few thousand of survivors. I was barely alive. I was walking, I was walking like a, you know, a, a dead man. Uh, my feet were destroyed, you know, skin on my feet was destroyed. Um, so after a, a, um, a couple of weeks, I uh, reunited with, with, with part of my family, with my mother, younger brother, my grandparents. Uh, after a, a few uh, months, I went back to school. Nobody even did not did not did ask me about my survival it, as it was as it, as if it was normal. Except one professor asked me about what I survived, about my experience, and nobody else, you know, people did not care because the war was still going on. Then after a few months, the Dayton Peace Agreement was signed, the war was over. Um, I started to go, uh, I, I um, started to work as an interpreter, then um, finished my schooling, uh, then uh, signed up uh, at the university in Sarajevo, then Constantly, you know, after my graduation, I was thinking to, to come back to Srebrenica to work for the memorial to tell the story, because I because knowing you know my experience um, before that happened, you know I buried my father. Uh, that was in, in two thousand three. Uh, I came to Bratunac. I, we were stopped by the police, so they told us that we had to walk 
to get off those buses and to walk because of a traffic jam. Uh, a local crowd, uh, Serb, Serbs standing on the side of the street behind the police line were constantly yelling at me, at all of us, spitting. I was being spat at while, you know, I was going to bury my father. Um, I even recognized some of war criminals uh, and I cannot even say how I felt inside as a human being. Um, uh, I then, uh, Two years later, I buried my twin brother. I had to put his bones with my bare hands in the grave, which was very, very difficult. Um, I barely survived that day. And uh, after four years, I came back to the memorial to tell the story. It was very difficult to tell the story at the beginning. I, you know, was surviving. You know, it was uh, like a you know, secondary uh, uh, victimization for me to survive again uh, the things that I survived. But it was also helping me, and um, um, I spent about 10 years working with the visitors, spent about seven years going abroad to speak. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, people would come up to me in, at the memorial while telling the story and just ask me, you know, to tell, to retell it again without even thinking how it was for me to retell it again, uh, which sometimes speak, tells, uh, speaks the vol you know the the vo volume of of insensitivity and uh, lack of knowledge of of visitors when it comes to understanding how it is for survivors to retell the story again. Uh, and I decided to work for the memorial because of my father, my my twin brother, my uncle, and all the victims who were killed as innocent innocent in, uh, innocent in individuals. And um, I try to uh, send a message of humanity with no hatred. Of, of course, uh, uh, I don't feel any hatred inside in, inside of my my heart, and I want to pass it on to young young engineer generation to make sure uh, that they don't hate. To to tell them that if I don't hate, I lost half of my family, and I still don't hate Serbs. Why would and why should they? hate because the hatred uh, had brought us to what, where we are and uh, it should be stopped and uh, I see my rule, rule at the memorial to contribute to, to uh, uh, prevention of, of future uh, uh, genocide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hassan. Um, you were talking and just I have so many memories uh, with you um, going to so many different places and I just was getting very emotional. So um, we're gonna continue on. Um, I'd like to introduce Anne Petrilla, who is a professor of the practice and coordinator of global initiatives at the University of Denver's Graduate School of Social Work. She's a co-author with Hassan of Voices from Srebrenica, Survivor Narratives of the Bosnian Genocide. Anne's areas of expertise include global cultural perspectives, trauma, grief, genocide, and oral histories. She and Hassan are in the final stages of completing an educational documentary and curriculum modules entitled The World Speaks and We Listen, which uses the voices of people throughout Bosnia who survived the war and the genocide to share their wisdom with US students of social work and human rights. Every summer, Anne leads an experiential Bosnian-based course and internship program for the University of Denver graduate students and has taken close to 300 university students to Bosnia, which is how I actually met her when she brought her students. I'd love to turn it over to you now, Anne. Thank you, Laura. It's great to see you and thank you for organizing and hosting this. Um, it's always, always wonderful to be um, anywhere with my friend and colleague, Hasan Asanovic, and um, even if it's just on a screen, and also to be here with um, Selma is a true honor. So I um, have, as as Laura said, been uh, taking students to Bosnia um, for many years now and uh, have been grounded, like the rest of us, um, and uh, been unable to do so the last few years. Hopefully we'll, we will be back again in the summer um, because I um, want very much to continue the um, education that um, and the, the exposure that students can have their meeting with people um, who have survived the, the siege of Sarajevo, the siege and the genocide of, of Srebrenica. And um, 
I started going to Bosnia, really, I would say it was my uh, good fortune. I was in the right place at the right time. My Bosnians tell me that it, it was my destiny, my Sudbina. So I will accept whatever it is or was. Um, it was an amazing opportunity. Then when I got to Bosnia and initially started learning about um, what happened in, in Sarajevo and through colleagues there at the University of Sarajevo, and then went over to Srebrenica, where, um, as luck would have it, the first day I went, the first time I went, um, was also Hassan's um, first day working there. And I met him and um, was so taken with his um, story that he had to tell, the history of what had happened, his own personal story. Um, and I just started thinking, I have to learn more about this. I have to learn more about Bosnia. I have to learn more about uh, Srebrenica. And then I need to figure out what I can do in terms of contributing to um, spreading knowledge about it to um, just what I felt really a very, very strong um, need and want to figure out um, somehow to, to be involved and realize that as an educator, I could um, figure out a way to, to open this part of the world up to students. Um, it's, it's an unusual experience for um, a uh, US student actually to go to Bosnia. It's unusual for many people in the U.S. to go to Bosnia, although that is changing. Um, but so I was able to, um, in partnership with, again, uh, friends and colleagues in Sarajevo, to develop a course that um, was an, is an immersion course, really, with bringing students. Um, they initially do academic work where they learn about the history and the culture and um, the amazingly rich, rich history and culture of the region. And then... We look at, of course, uh, the role that religion, ethnicity, um, propaganda, uh, all of the um, nationalism, everything played in this war and this genocide. And this, the, the strength, though, of the program that we have is a meeting with survivors, particularly in Srebrenica. And that is um, very much in partnership um, with Hassan that I do that. He's very much a, a part of the teaching of our students. And... Um, through that experience and having this really remarkable opportunity to um, get to know people very, very well and spend enough time there that um, it feels very much like a home and people welcome me um, into their homes and into to this story. And I know from living in the States um, that those who control um, the narrative of any event or experience control the history. And we are in the US now in a reckoning, if you will, of trying to um, more accurately portray our own history. And um, so I've known for a long time the power of, of narratives and personal narratives, but have also known um, from my work that I've done in a variety of settings that um, while it is the most important for people who have experienced situations themselves to tell the story and therefore own their own story and own the history, it's also um, so difficult as Hassan said in his remarks that it's um, it's a, can be very very re-traumatizing to people. So um, one of the uh, areas that I've really tried to sort out for myself in my work as an American, a U.S. American, working cross culturally in Bosnia and with bringing students um, to cross culturally um, to Bosnia is how to balance that, how to um, use our uh, privilege that we have, our, our access perhaps to more um, information, outside sources, how to use that to elevate people's voices and stories if they want us to do so, and they have very much said they do want us to do so. How to balance that, though, with what is potentially a re-traumatizing event be um, because of having to or, or cho choosing to, but telling, process of telling these stories, which are um, so horrendous and hideous in terms of what people have had to survive and also so unbelievably inspiring in terms of um, their their resilience and ability to survive. So um, that has been a big focus of my work on, um, with these all of these projects that again I've had the uh, unbelievable privilege and pleasure of working on in Bosnia primarily with my um, friend Hassan and um, it's something that I work with my students on really, really driving home this point of, we should never stop questioning the ethics of what we're doing. Are we doing them um, 
why are we doing what we're doing? Are we doing it to primarily, again, elevate voices of people whose voices may otherwise not be heard outside of Bosnia in this case? Are we doing it for our own good? Are we doing it? Why are we doing it? And how are we doing it? And um, that is something I continue to ask myself. I would probably ask myself that until the last word I ever speak. And I think that that's appropriate, that any of us who are doing work um, in a culture that is not our own, that we need to always check ourselves, um, always make sure we are walking alongside this journey with people whose journey it is and whose story it is, and to um, never lose sight of that. That um, and that it perhaps is unavoidable that it's re-traumatizing. Um, and then what do we do about that? How do we make it as um, supportive? of an experience as possible? How do we always make sure it's a choice that people have? You know, it's one thing to have relationships with people, which we have to have in order to do this kind of work. And if in conversation, spontaneous um, stories come up, spontaneous sharing of experiences, that's one thing. And that's a, an amazing gift to be on the receiving end of that. But it's quite another thing to schedule a time um, with someone knowing that this is what we're going to do. We're going to talk about their experiences. And um, that's the piece that I think we have to just be so very, very um, cautious about and so very respectful of the fact that um, that if I'm talking to somebody in Bosnia, we, you started, um, Laura, with a um, wonderful tribute to Hira, who is someone who we did interview for our book and who um, just recently uh, passed away. And, um, you know, when we were talking to her, it was, um, so unbelievable because in terms of her, um, ability to talk about what she had experienced, the sorrow, the, 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 uh, pain, the desperate longing for wanting to find, um, the remains of her son, Nino. And then also, uh, about her, she's this um, was this amazing um, natural community organizer and um, organizer of women and women's voices. And so, what I found myself thinking about during all of that, and then in writing our book with about with Hira and everyone else, um, is how to use her words because there are her words and it's her story, and it needed to stay her story, but also to put it into some sort of a context that could be um, understandable outside of Bosnia for people who didn't necessarily have the context of the war and the genocide. And also to make sure that Hira and everybody else that we interviewed and that we wrote about was um, prevented, presented fairly and respectfully and in a way that showed all of them, their sorrow, their joy, their pleasure, their strength, their quirkiness, whatever it might have been. So I'm hoping that um, we succeeded in doing that because that is uh, certainly, was certainly our goal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, you've touched upon a lot of really important points and we'll definitely talk a little bit more in the discussion about um, people's lives before the war and really kind of speaking truth to who they are as human beings and not as strictly, um, categorized forever as genocide survivors. I'd like to introduce our um, third speaker, Dr. Selma Leidestorf, and she is a professor emeritus, emeritus of oral history and culture at the University of Amsterdam, and she's published widely about survivors of genocide and trauma. She's extensively researched the Jewish community of Amsterdam, victims of the Holocaust and other genocides, in which she primarily employs her training as an oral historian to investigate the ways memory is framed and modified over time. In 2002, Dr. Leidesdorf began an oral history project to document the experiences of women who survived the Srebrenica genocide. Her work, Surviving the Bosnian Genocide, The Women of Srebrenica Speak, was originally published in Dutch and has subsequently been translated into both Bosnian and English. Additionally, Dr. Leidesdorf has investigated the history of Sobibor and collected interviews with survivors and co-plaintiffs of the Demjanjuk trial, we're talking about the Holocaust, um, which is currently held at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. She is one of the principal editors of Rutledge's Memory and Narrative series and has frequently lectured on oral history. Dr. Leidesdorf. 
Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for making this very valuable contact with people who started their research much later than I did my research, because I started my research around 2002. And I started it because of the report, the official Dutch report on the events in Srebrenica were published. And when they were presented, very angry women barked out and said it was not their story. And that was something I recognized. I'm a child of a concentration camp survivor. <clears throat> and I know so well this anger that nobody is listening to you. And I felt compelled and forced to go there and see what the real story was, which was not the official report, of, of course not. It was difficult. It was politically very difficult to do this in the Netherlands. I was absolutely ostracized. I had a long and hard struggle to find money to travel up and down to Bosnia. And let's be fair, every interview has been transcribed and fully translated into English, which is a lot of money. And I, in some way I managed to raise it. What I wanted to do is to show an image of the women of Srebrenica and compare them to the mothers of Plaza de Majo in Argentina. And so it's the same story with those women in Argentina. They are recognized and these women in Bosnia are. And so I went there and my first experience was one of the women of Srebrenica throwing stones and mud to me. Later on, we became very good friends. And I had to fight myself, my way, into the belief that I was looking for a kind of truth, that I was doing something different, that I was not a journalist, that I took their stories very serious. And how I managed, I can't tell, probably with the help of one of the doctors in Tuzla who started to trust me, and I'm grateful to her. Um, coming to Srebrenica, getting mud and stones to your head, leaving in a rush the small town because it became too dangerous. That was absolutely the first experience. But then slowly on, I became some kind of insider. I mean, I'm not Bosnian, absolutely not. I'm Jewish, I'm a child of concentration camp survivors. That's my identity. I'm also a child of somebody who suffered tremendously during the Japanese occupation of Indonesia. How to become an insider? You know, those women are generous. I love them. And as we know, 70% of the contact during an interview is not about words, but is about something else, which we, we don't have a name for. A kind of feeling you know from each other. It's also the story when um, the survivors of Rwanda came to Bosnia, they met the Bosnian survivors and there was, although they didn't speak each other's language, there was a kind of immediate contact. Now what that is, what that feeling is that I leave to the neurologist, I don't do it. And slowly on I got involved in this very sad story, very hard to listen to. This sad story about missing, about being left alone, being betrayed by the world, and the role of the Dutch army. Well, then I got into more trouble, but that's okay. I mean, I was looking for a kind of truth, so it was okay, all the trouble I got into. Um, it has been wonderful to travel through the small villages of um, that part of Bosnia, and to speak so, to so many people, to eat their food, to wait for the evening to come after an interview, and to sit together and let the sorrow sink somewhere in the, in the air. You 
can't say the source sinks into the air, but it can be done. And be very quiet with each other. Um, I don't think interviewing the way I did is re traumatizing. I don't think that at all. I think it helps. And some people told me they very much wanted to dance all night after an interview. And maybe it's my personality. I have no idea. And I'm not going to be proud of what I did. It was just years of hard work, a lot of lot of love, a lot of friendship, traveling, traveling, and in the end, it was the hard job of writing the book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Leidersdorf. Um, we were talking a little bit before the event started about the role of gender, um, and we will come back to that because I want to talk about. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the process of doing. Um, talking with survivors. And I think one of the things that's very obvious that you've mentioned that's also comes up in the book is that when you started your research, it was very, you know, few years since the genocide happened. And, you know, for context, um, often when we're talking about Srebrenica, we're talking about July 11th, 1995, but ethnic cleansing and torture and the murders and the suffering begin well before that. And so this is sort of the pinnacle event that, or the culmination of a lot of horror and a lot of um, just atrocious and monstrous crimes that take place. And um, in both books, something that also was very striking is not just the numerous traumas that each survivor experiences, but especially for those survivors, um, the thousands of people who gather outside of um, the battery factory, the screaming at night, so here they are in their most vulnerable and you can't even sleep at night because of the horrors and the murders and the rapes that are going on. And I wanted to um, pose this question to all of you, which is the impact of time and why some survivors didn't want to speak then, but have come forth. And I know this is something, Anne and Hassan, we've talked a lot about because there are people that you reached out to initially who wanted to um, stay silent. Um, well, I can start from my perspective, and that is that actually the people we reached out to um, ev that Hassan um, contacted, everybody wanted to be involved in our book, um, but they, but some who were protected witnesses at The Hague wanted to remain anonymous. And so um, that was very interesting to me that through the, um, I think the power of them uh, gain regaining their own story and their own voice that they then decided that in fact several of them said the exact words of they they wanted to go on the record of with their own names and with this being um having something that had happened to them so um and i would just say that i um i had a very different experience i mean it could be the function of time as you are saying then um i had a different experience than someone was describing in terms of um people's reactions to telling their stories. And while, um, while everybody that we interviewed for our book and have interviewed for our other subsequent um, uh, projects have um, wanted to do it, stuck with it, even if it got hard during the process, um, said they wanted to do it, um, kept doing it, we're glad they did it. To a person, I would say that it was, um, it was very difficult. And I, that's been my experience, not just in this, this setting, but with all the work I've done with trauma is that it's, um, unless somebody has the opportunity to tell their story over and over and over again, for example, if that's part of your job, or I don't know, Hassan can speak to that since he's someone who has been part of his job. But unless that's the case that people get, um, almost um, have some ability to have some distance from their own self, that that it, that it is difficult. And it is, um, people talk to us about what they were gonna need to do later um, in terms of, sort of uh, the, the support they would need, the you know, support we offered, but in terms of them kind of putting themselves back together again. So I just wanted to say that um, that was certainly our experience pretty much across the board. So you, you have, uh, answering this question, question, you have a survivor before you. So uh, as a survivor, um, uh, when I started to work at the memorial, of course, I didn't know how difficult it was going to be. But uh, believe me, um, those first moments were as if I was surviving the whole thing. 
it was it it did it really hurt and um it was question of if i would survive that day if i when i had to tell the story and that is uh with every survivor except for those who are used to telling the story like i do now like mothers of Srebrenica, you know those who are uh, usually on television you know? but those who tell tell it for the first time it is very 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 difficult difficult for them and i uh did uh, three oral history projects for, for Srebrenica genesis memorial uh, we interviewed 300 people um um, um, and uh, I uh, contacted hundreds and hundreds of survivors, and uh, most of them said no, because uh, first of all, they they are really afraid to tell the story because of their, their own trauma. Um, sometimes, you know, they don't know uh, what to expect. Uh, they they are afraid of of, of public exposure. exposure. They are afraid of camera. They don't know how the story will be used and all the things. So now as we gain more, more um, credibility as the memorial, we gain more, more, more um, trust from the side of survivors. And those who want to tell the story, they, they will, uh, when we call them, they will say yes. Uh, but we, we do actually do, we do everything to make sure to include ethics, to, to bring in the issue of of uh, this, um, uh, psychotherapy, and uh, I, as a survivor, because I led three projects, uh, uh, I knew what was important to me. So then I, I I decided to apply that to all survivors, and I did my best to protect them, actually to protect them from people who don't know what is, is what secondary victimization is, you know. Because you know, if you come as a journalist, you just do it as a journalist because you don't know. You don't do it on purpose, but you really don't know, you know. So uh, I really, you know, did everything to be like an umbrella, an umbrella for them, for 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 survivors. And but uh, we need now what we need. We need institutions. We need institu institutionalized approach towards this issue and this is what the memorial does now in collaboration with our partners and with, uh, with our donors. Um, I don't want to disagree with Hassan, but I think I use a completely different way of interview views as I have seen from your book. You work with a topic list, I work with life stories. Um, I start in the very beginning of their childhood. I don't deal only with the genocide, but the life before. There's the story of Hanifa, who talks about the loneliness of being an orphan in a small village. And it ends with, no, it doesn't end with, but it goes to the genocide and then to the life after. I, I don't know. My work is completely different. My interviews are completely different from what you are doing. The interviews are not categorizable. They last for hours and hours and hours. Um, there is no topic list. I leave it to them. And I think that's also the experience in oral history. You have different ways of doing interviews. And uh, I belong to those who very much lean towards psychoanalysis, like, as psychoanalysis giving people the freedom to speak. And then you get a different result, I'm absolutely sure. And I completely respect what you're doing, but I'm doing something difficult, uh, different, and it is all named oral history. I think that's a really important point because, um, Hassan, we talked about this in the beginning. There were um, some oral history projects where it was uh, an interview that was really sort of like 10 questions and there wasn't a lot of discussion about the light people's lives before. And I think some of one of the things that comes up in your book a lot is um, village life, right? Many people go to Bosnia, they might just be in Sarajevo or many people who go to Srebrenica go for the first two weeks in July. The whole emphasis again is on the 20, you know, the uh, uh, between July 11th and 22nd, 1995. Um, 
And that really cuts off the larger story of suffering and the larger story of people's lives. And, and Hassan, you talked a little bit about this and I wanted to open this question up to all three of you is the ethics involved. And you know, when I started doing research, I had to do a very big application for the Institutional Review Board um, to make sure that um, the identities were of the people I was interviewing were protected and um, there was lots of different kinds of consent. But Selma, when we were talking, this also came up at our, our center, you have audio tapes of the women. And at the time, a lot of these interviews were conducted, we weren't handing them sheets of paper to get written consent. All of this hinges on oral consent. And I wanted to ask all of you about um, the challenges of gaining consent in a society where you know written consent, this doesn't have anything to do with them. I would never ask. So at that moment, I mean, we have to now, but I would never ask anybody for a written consent, partly because many of the women don't know what the consent is. It would scare them to hell. Um, I would give them back some CD with the interview. And I, that's something I never told. I would send them a letter thanking them on behalf of the university. And to my amazement, when I entered some of the houses, the uh, letter of thanking, thank you was hanging on the wall. It was so sweet. Uh, yeah. When you interview in villages, when you interview people who don't have much training, you, it's impossible to ask for consent. That's the misunderstanding between the official oral history institutions and me at the moment. So, Lori, Laura, so when it, when it comes uh, when it comes to what we did uh, in terms of our book, we we of course you know we uh, we started to uh, interview people from the early very early childhood from the tape from the, from actually time when they were born till now every aspect of their lives and uh, and of course uh, you know we did that uh, in uh, an environment which is um, uh, their house usually you know and all of the actually the most of those people are my friends and they felt more than they felt more than comfortable uh, speaking to me and they knew that that will be used in the best uh, in the best way possible. So of course, um, uh, it's um, very very difficult, you know, to 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 speak about Srebrenica. So as I, I, I repeat again, as a, as a survivor, um, especially for those who speak for the first time, you know, it's it's uh, really really difficult. Uh, so people can have uh, different experiences in interviewing the people who who uh, might. Uh, have appeared uh, more often uh, on, on 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 different uh, platforms, so uh, uh, telling their stories. But those who tell it for the first time, it's uh, really really difficult for them to to speak. And uh, as I, I repeat again, even even then, uh, as, as as a recognizable face from the memorial, uh, people felt really safe with me, and I did uh, everything I could to protect the. Uh, their lives, you know, their stories, and how actually they felt to, to make sure that they go uh, through through that process. And there is no really, there is no easy process when when tell tell telling this story. And afterwards, um, uh, I uh, those uh, my friends, I usually have coffee after afterwards or have lunch, and I can f uh, I I could tell on their faces how uh, really uh, uh, how they felt, you know. So they, there was nothing enjoy, enjoyable uh, afterwards, but uh, they did. They knew, of course, that they did uh, something which was very important for for the future. That their, their story will be put on the paper for the world to 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 learn. Um, Hassan, I just wanted to follow up very briefly um, because we do have a question. When we're talking about protecting people, you know, the context is that there are war criminals walking around. There are people in Srebrenica and actually across Bosnia, you know, thousands of people who committed murders and gruesome crimes living in the communities. And I wondered 
you know, in terms of security and protecting them literally from harassment. I mean, I remember doing research and, and someone pulled me aside and said, everybody knows that you're here, which means that everybody knows that they're talking, you know, who's talking to you. How do you, you know, has that come up? I mean, they, they were, they were uh, issues, you know, when we interviewed people for our book uh, uh, and the people said that, you know, they, that they didn't want us to use their names. A few of them then later, you know, as time went on, um, they said that we should use their names because they they, uh, they just decided. So, uh, and it's, of course, some of them are um, uh, witnesses before the, 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 the Hague Tribunal, and some of them live here, uh, so they could be the possible targets uh, of, of, uh, of um, um, you know, Crazy people uh, who who could uh, you know maybe decide to 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 harm them, um, and um, and of course you know you have women who 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 live on their own, who lost the entire 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 families you know like Saliha Osmanovich she lives um, close friend of Anne and and and, and my, my close friend she actually holds the picture of Anne in her house uh, that's how close they are. Um, um, she testified against Modic, and she is in uh, her, her story is in our book. So we know Saliha for over you know twelve years. Um, um, so she lives uh, near Drina, which is uh, very close to Serbia. So uh, Serb village is really close by, and there is uh, actually a monument dedicated to Serb to the killed Serb soldiers. So she could be, you know, anytime she could be could be attacked because of 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 um, of the fact that if somebody would find out that, you know, she said something which they didn't like. So in this sense, you know, when people do research, when people do writing, filming, they have to be really aware of where where they are and who they are talking to. Uh, you know, I'm telling you as a survivor, as somebody who is uh, is a, who is a. Uh, is insider, you know, from from the actual place. I never felt threatened while I was doing my research. It was a completely different time. I mean, we we crossed minefields. That was a very big problem at that moment to go to the villages and to be escorted by two Bosnian <coughs> soldiers to choose the good way. I was never threatened, but it has a consequence. What Hassan is saying, my tapes are not in Bosnia. It feels un unsafe. They are in Amsterdam. And I'm trying to find a place where I can store them outside Bosnia. We talked about the challenges of that because there are no fit written consent forms. Um, and I wanted to turn it back to you um, about the, com you know, the conversation about um, gaining oral versus written consent? Um, I, you know, <laughs> the issue of consent, of course, is, is so complicated, isn't it? Be, depending on where you're starting. And if you're starting in a US um, institution, a US university, there's very, very clear guidelines with the IRBs, et cetera. I know elsewhere that is the same. And so what I've had to do is really, um, work with my own institution in terms of what does consent look like in a culturally responsive way that it is not appropriate in you know talking to to most if not all of the people that we talk to in Bosnia to present them with an IRB form that says you need to sign here and here's what who to call if we harm you and all those things that are um, you know part of IRB consents for for a good reason in many cases so in this case we also did oral consents um, and you know we recorded things as um, Selma did, as Laura, you've done, as we all do when we're um, interviewing people, and of course had their consent to do that. Um, and then, though, when we went to um, to publish our book and write about um, what people had said in their own words, our publisher was very much um, was very nervous that we didn't have written consents. And so, what we did was we had to go back through all of the. Um, the original words again, some some in Bos that were in Bosnian, um, some in English, you know, all transcribed though, of course, and translated, but that we had to go back through and, and uh, show in our recordings where Hassan had explained what we were doing, what we were going to be doing and got people's um, oral consent. And our publisher then 
allowed us to say this is what we have, and so therefore people did did consent. But I think that it's a it's a broader question, really, of what is what makes sense within the culture in which we're doing these these interviews or having these conversations. Um, and I just wanted to um, go back to one other thing that we were talking about earlier, and that is the whole um, sort of methodology involved in oral histories. And there's so many different methodologies and so many uh, projects calling themselves oral histories, others disagreeing that they are oral histories, um, that we made the decision um, very early on, Hassan and I did that um, in this, with this book and with our other project that we're working on, the, the documentary, um, that we did not want a topic list. We did not want it to be structured in a way that I know why people do structure interviews in the way they do, because then later if you're coding or doing all those things, it makes it so much easier. But we didn't want that either. We wanted the um, free flowing um, a conversation and allowing the, the, again, the person who owns the narrative, whose story it is, to tell it in the way that they wanted to. And so, um, so I'm really glad we made that decision, even though it was very, very difficult because it, you end up with thousands of pages of, of transcriptions of, um, that you have to then somehow put in some sort of chronological order or a way, uh, some order that is easy, relatively easy for a reader to follow, but, um, uh, but it's certainly much more challenging than projects that do a, um, a topic list and follow a very, very strict um, interview protocol. And I want to thank you also for mentioning methodologies. It's come up in the questions. Um, and also you both mentioned, and, and some of you also mentioned this as well, that when survivors are talking, often it's not necessarily telling their stories in a linear fashion at all. There's memories that are coming up and um, that was also just kind of very telling. And I just, I'm looking at the comments and one of the things that happens when we talk about Srebrenica and Bosnia is all these other questions are coming up. What's the current political context? How is this connected to World War II? Um, why is genocide denial rife? And you know, this is a moment I encourage all of you on this call and for those who will be watching the recording later to take a look at what's happening in the news. This country is on the verge of splitting again in a very significant way. Genocide denial is not only rife, but you know, when we talk about the Holocaust, we're talking about presence and absence. And this has happened decades ago. In, in Bosnia and in Srebrenica, you know, this is happening now. And not only did we mention before the war criminals that are running around, the genocide denial is rife. The, the, the central, the federal government is very weak. We have the Republic of Srpska and Milorad Dodik, who is part of, uh, you know, the, the president uh, of the country right now, threatening to, in a sense, secede. And violence could actually break out. Hassan, could you talk a little bit about the climate and what's taking place? What's actually happening right now in Bosnia is, is um, that the, the, the mentioned uh, the member of the, of the Bosnian presidency, Milorad Dodik, who comes from, um, who is elected from the Republika Srpska, according to the Dayton Peace Agreement, is try, trying to do, is trying to dismantle the, 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 the central uh, government to basically um, and, um, uh, disown. Uh, the army of Bosnia and Herzegovina actually anti to create to, to create his own uh, Bosnian Serb army, which uh, uh, used to uh, exist here during the war and which committed the actual genocide in, in Srebrenica and in Bosnia. So he wants to uh, to dismantle the other institutions such such as uh, taxation uh, system. Um, and judiciary and some some other things, basically, you know, to dismantle the main uh, structures of the state, uh, which uh, would uh, definitely um, cause uh, lots of uh, troubles. And I'm afraid not just only incidents, but also a potential conflict, because you know, understanding the the the, the, the constitutional structure of Bosnia, Bosnia is divided into two entities: uh, the, the the federation. The Bosnia can Croat, Croat majority and the, the Republic of Srpska with the Serb majority, and there is one only a tiny, tiny um, district called Brčko district, which actually divides these two, two entities into two two parts, where uh, which is actually owned by the state of Bosnia, governed by the state of Bosnia and Herzegovina under the, the under the supervision of the international community. So. If for nothing, uh, the, the the potential conflict would start because of Brčko, you know, 
And uh, what about Srebrenica? What about Memorial? What about uh, the, the genocide which happened uh, 26 years ago? And uh, there are so many issues which, which can really st stir up, stir up uh, another potential conflict. And um, what really worries me is, um, is um, a reluctance of the international community, uh, all, all those stake stakeholders, uh, that uh, they um, don't do anything. You know, they bring actually they bring uh, their envoys here uh, to try to make some to s peace and to try to have some negotiations. But uh, what uh, really needs to happen is um, uh, we need to they need to strengthen the, the central government to make sure that um, the nationalism is re eradicated, that the hatred is is eradicated that denial is, is stopped um, so that um, uh, young generations have a better future. So if we build uh, uh, stability, then they, there would be peace, there would be some sort of, of um, an, an atmosphere where young people could uh, decide maybe to stay here and build a better future. None of that is happening. We never started to reconcile. We never started to basically to to, to um, um, go through the process of healing because of all of these issues as such as denial of genocide, glorification of war criminals. So and, uh, what really worries me is that this is uh, all um, being coordinated by, by, by uh, in my opinion, by Serbia uh, with the support from Russia. Um, and this is what uh, we hope that the United States will understand and uh, tackle. No. But, and this is uh, what we, we are what we are talking about here is is uh, another potential conflict. But Hassan, aren't you hoping too much? This is a I'm very pessimistic about Europe. This is the age of nationalism. Bosnia mm -hmm. is surrounded by uh, countries where nationalism is very popular: Hungary, Serbia, uh, Moldavia whatever you, you name. So um, I think the Dayton Agreement was a mistake, uh, although it brought temporary peace. Um, I'm quite pessimistic what can be done in Bosnia because of this tendency to celebrate nationalism again. I mean, uh, I have to agree on that one because uh, the other day, Milo Radodic was visited by Orban, uh, yeah. the president of, of Hungary. I read, uh, I, I read Bosnian newspapers. Yes, <laughs> and there are uh, right, right uh, wing uh, leaders uh, in surrounding countries, uh, not to mention Serbia, of course, Slovenia and some other neighbors around. So the climate is is not suitable uh, in terms of, of, of preventing all of this. I really do agree on, on, on that one with you, Selma. Uh, but uh, as always, we, we, we expect, uh, especially from the Bosnian friend, uh, President uh, Biden, who so passionately used to speak uh, during the Bosnian war, advocate for for uh, Bosnia, Bosnia as, as a sovereign, independent state, and. Uh, urging uh, the, the then uh, American administration to stop the genocide and war in Bosnia. And um, I'm hoping that these news will get to him that uh, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a probably a world's most powerful um, nation that they could really do something. We need a deployment of NATO troops in Bosnia and we need uh, to start things from, from, from the starters. Uh, My real hope is that Bosnia will be a member of the European community uh, together with the other belligerent nations. That's my objective as the only solution. I don't believe Biden is going to do very much. He knows, he knows, absolutely, he knows about Kosovo. But he's, I don't think he's going to do, I think hope comes from Europe, certainly. And hope comes from Europe, but Europe is also taking a back seat. And so, um, you know, as you both have mentioned, the rise of nationalism and the impact not only on Bosnia, but around the world is very, very threatening. I wanted to just, I know we've run over a little bit, but I, um, 
and we will definitely schedule another event to get into the specifically the role of gender, but you know, two very prominent women who led different organizations of the mothers of Srebrenica have passed in the last few years. And um, at the same time, so much of the work that you all have done has really showcased their lives what it means to live in Bosnia, what it means to come of age at a time in the former Yugoslavia. And not many, many of the women come from smaller villages and didn't necessarily have the opportunity to um, get their education. And I'm, I'm trying to wind this up into a bigger conversation. We have two comments. And one is in, you know, I'd love to know more from you both, from all of you about has the psychocultural environment shifted? I've been there before when it's taboo to go to therapy. It's taboo even as a woman to in, in many villages to go to the gynecologist and we have to say these things out loud. And, um, and you also write about the endless cups of coffee and food. And so did survivors feel comfortable talking with you and did you have to offer any incentives? You know, I sometimes we talk about in oral histories offering money or offering gifts. Um, so I thought we could sort of tie this all in for the last round of questions. I refuse to give any gifts. I would bring coffee and sugar uh, because there was this story of some women who talked endlessly because they got paid by the hour. So then it makes sense to talk very long. For me, those gifts of those interviews were a sign of friendship, of solidarity. Um, certain topics you couldn't touch. Uh, probably I haven't tried. I have several stories of rape, but Olivia Simic has several stories of rape of men, which is, I think, a terrible taboo. Um, yeah, you couldn't talk about certain things, absolutely. Gosh, Laura, you raised so many good questions in that one question. Um, I would say that, um, We, uh, I'm not sure which question to answer. Um, I would say that again, the, um, for the, the interviews that Hassan and I did for this book and our other projects is it was completely um, led the topics, the, the um, direction that it went was completely led by those who were, who had survived and were, were telling the story. Um, there were sometimes people alluded to situations that may have happened. Um, sometimes people went into great detail about situations that had happened. Um, and we saw it as our role to listen to that. And um, then to, of course, then there is a judgment call on the part of those writing the stories, um, what to include, what not, how to include things. And that's the huge responsibility, I think, of those of us who are um, gifted with being able to hear these stories. Um, and that's why I, I personally feel, again, as someone who is not of the culture, but adores the culture and spends so much time in the culture, um, I personally felt it's such a huge responsibility to try to get it right because of, um, because these, these are, um, they're tender, um, invaluable um, stories. And I guess one other thing I want to say, which you didn't ask, but I would like to say, and that is that I also had this unique experience, um, unique at least to me, um, of, of doing this alongside Hassan, who um, played two roles. He played many roles, but one role, obviously, um, and I don't mean to diminish his experience by calling it a role, but of being of having survived what he survived, um, the role of being then the link between all of the people that we interviewed. And if he didn't know the people directly, someone he knew knew the people. Um, and that I, my credibility was, um, again, directly tied to, to his and that people trusted him and therefore trusted me. And I had, for many of these people, established relationships with them a long time ago. But when it came right down to it, um, you know, it was his, his experience, who he is, how he is, um, and his connection that, um, that opened up many of these doors for us. And the final thing I want to say about it is that for me doing this with him, um, you know, and watching the experience that it had on him, if I may. And again, from my 
perspective of what happened um, that I could see. And, um, you know, Hassan can clearly speak for himself, but I could see that there was some part of this that was so very, very painful for him. Um, hearing stories that either he hadn't heard before in all the detail or things that were just so close to home. And so that was another um, time where I just really had to question um, myself and was this, you know, should we be doing this and giving him, you know, every out he could possibly ever want of let's, you know, do maybe we shouldn't be doing this because it's so difficult all the way around for people. So I just want to acknowledge that and that the tremendous contribution and gift that um, Hassan has given given all of us. So in terms of, of, of this book, I also found it, uh, you know, as, as my work at the memorial, you know, which is, which was very therapeutic, but this writing this book and working on this book, book was also very therapeutic for me. Uh, I had to translate every interview. I had to work on transcripts and listen, and li re-listen to some of those transcripts to make sure that we correct, uh, you know, all, all the all the errors, all the things which, you know, you could not catch, you know, hearing them, you know, as, as a native speaker, I could catch and understand everything, but I had to, you know, recheck many, many times, you know, for some uh, things which was difficult to hear. Um, so hearing some of the survivors uh, and uh, translating, uh, interpreting them was really heartbreaking. And uh, I, you know, to, to tell you the truth, I was taking some uh, pills, you know, to calm myself down, you know, and I was, you know, when, when somebody, my, one of my friends who I don't want to mention his name here, was a dear friend to me when I was interpreting his story, I was surviving with him. And I was begging him to stop, you know, in my inner voice. And when he was done, when Anne told me that I should check his, you know, transcript again, I, I, I left it uh, to the last, you know, because I could not face with the trauma again. And eventually I did. And every time it was therapeutic and even going to Belgrade, you know, when, when we had to interview people from Serbia, to get that perspective, I didn't, at first I didn't want to go, then uh, a few months later I decided to, and I found it very ther therapeutic there because I met friends and I, that was another obstacle that I, that I uh, conquered, you know, uh, and uh, uh, to shift this to, to uh, survivors who we interview, uh, your question, Laura, about uh, therapy, and uh, it's, uh, not not many things have changed in terms of how society looks at at, at trauma. Uh, this is still there is still big social stigma. If um, uh, you have uh, um, uh, issues um, in terms of PTSD, any issues regarding your trauma as a survivor, uh, you have to keep it inside of yourself. You can maybe talk to your wife, to your mother. Uh, if you speak it openly, you are being uh, uh, labeled as a, an insane person, as a less worthy person, as somebody who is not capable to work, who is potentially maybe even dangerous. And you know, taking uh, the, the, all the things uh, when it comes to your survivor survi survival, you should be taking, you should be given uh, all all the possible care you have. To do the opposite, you know, to fight with the things which should which you should never fight with, you know, society, the state should give all these services to survivors, but instead, it's still it's still you know uh, among our uh, within our families. Uh, so our our families uh, our family is the only all, the only uh, resort we have. So from coming. Uh, things that should be given uh, from the state or from the NGOs are given to a small number of people who have access to those. But uh, the, the, the most of, of people uh, really never had a chance or could not go there because of, of so many of them, you know. And uh, uh, I really, you know, in, fu in future, I really would want to spend more time in, advo in advocacy for survivors of, of, of death march, such as, as, as myself, uh, especially those who, who are unemployed, who uh, don't have uh, any income, 
many of them are now, I mean, getting old, they, they don't have any, anybody to, I mean, they, they don't have basic um, uh, um, uh, healthcare, you know, not to mention if, if, they, if they go through, through the issues of PTSD and uh, the most of them do, and, and they don't speak about that. Uh, so this is something that, you know, we need to uh, pay more attention to in future, uh, uh, apart from the issues of, of, of uh, you know, even, you know, a raped women in Bosnia are, are now uh, uh, financially being taken care of by the Federation of Bosnia. Uh, a few years ago, there, there was a law which was uh, passed. So they, at least, you know, they have uh, income. There are still there are still so many problems in terms of raped women in terms of how they are being treated by by uh, different stakeholders in terms of of getting to getting uh, justice uh, in terms of secondary victimization. So that uh, these are issues of our judiciary and procedures, etc., etc., etc. But for us, for survivors of that march, I think um, nothing has been done. You know, it's been twenty six, seven, seven years. But it is also a matter of money. I mean, Bosnia is a very poor country. And uh, I know several of the psychiatrists who try to treat survivors and they say there's just a lack of money. Well, they keep to very traditional methods of treating trauma. And there are more, much, more, much more modern ways to deal with PTSD, narrative exposure therapy, for instance, which is much cheaper. Um, it, it looks like another world when it comes to mental health. So uh, just to add one thing, uh, in our first project with Sarajevo World Childhood Museum, we had um, a psychotherapist. Um, she used EMDR uh, to treat uh, uh, people who we interviewed. So we also, in, in um, the current project, we um, used a psychotherapist but we did not have enough funding, so we, we couldn't use her uh, constantly. So in, in, in our uh, future projects, we really want to make sure that as, as the memorial, we really do pay attention to this issue that uh, survivors are taken care of, that, that they, they have this service available, available if they want. You, know, you can never make somebody into having this therapy if, if uh, they don't want that therapy, but at least you know we can uh, make sure that they they have it uh... no and i think also it's so vital that those recommendations come from you and come from the memorial and come from the community it is totally inappropriate and i mean this was one of the struggles i had for me as an outsider to show up even though i spent a lot of time over the years and to say well if you get re-traumatized call this doctor i mean i'll never forget it i was in um <laughs> one of the cities um up north and um, we were sitting there and a survivor was telling us the story of what happened in his community. And there were very gruesome images on the wall and a woman comes in and you know, the, the habit in Bosnia, you have what you have and you share it with everyone. So she throws these cigarettes down on the table and her whole demeanor just doesn't feel right. And so this male survivor then put this woman on the spot to say what happened to her and what happened to her was very gruesome and she had been raped and why was she there? She was there because he needed to escort her to counseling because she was absolutely accosted and people would yell at her on the street because she was going to seek treatment. And I think that, um, you know, as time goes on, I mean, it's a wonder to me that people are, are able to continue with their lives um, across the entire country. Uh, it, it's the level of PTSD and horror is just overwhelming. Um, and there's many more things that we want to talk about, and we will absolutely host another event. To, right. um, yeah. Just one, 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 one thing. Um, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm not going to take up a, a lot of time. Oh, please, absolutely, go ahead. The, the, other, the other day, we interviewed people in Sarajevo, and when we got to one of our uh, uh, candidates, uh, uh, his name is um, uh, Mavludin, who is actually uh, one of the characters from uh, our book. The moment when I came there, it was uh, uh, around 10 o'clock in the morning, so I, that was not too early. He he did not even get in the car, he started to cry. And when we got to the place where he was supposed to be interviewed, uh, you know, I asked him if he, if he had 
food. He said that he did not eat. I immediately ran to buy some food and I brought food and I offered him food, drinks. He said, no, I cannot eat. I said, why? Because he said he had uh, stomach trouble. He's uh, throwing up all the time, uh, probably because of his stress. He only eats in the evening. So after the interview, I offered him to take him to the lunch. Then he smoked a cigarette. He, he said, no, I still have a, you know, I still have a stomach problem, problems. So uh, it's, it's uh, really difficult, you know. I'm not trying to compare my survival with, with his or with anybody else's, but, you know, even I myself have to go through these issues every, every day, every night, you know. And sometimes I don't even tell my family, my friends, it's just me, you know. And I know that is going to, 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 to last till the moment I die. That's with all of us. So let's try to make something for these people to ease their lives in closing. You've changed my life. We've talked about this many times, the memories I have, especially um, the first few times I went to the memorial and sitting with you outside in the heat and just listening to you educate people, um, not only about your experience, but to carry the weight and the responsibility of telling the entire history. Um, I will always be forever grateful to you. Um, thank you. Thank and you. Anne, it is always such a joy to work with you. Salma, I'm so grateful we were able to have this conversation and I keep referencing it, but we will be scheduling another talk because we could be talking about this for hours. Um, I wanna thank everyone for participating today, for joining us. I highly encourage everyone um, to reach out and get Selma's book and to get Anne and Hassan's books. I think that the two of them go very well together. They're some of the best books that I've read and I've certainly read so much um, about Srebrenica. And, the last thing I'll say is that um, with all the horror and heartache and scary things that are going on, the people in Bosnia that I've always interacted with are some of the kindest, most genuine, loving people in the world and who have always welcomed me with open arms. And there's a reason that those of us have spent any length of time in Bosnia and in Srebrenica continue to go back and love the people there because um, Hassan, you and, and the community have just always been beyond gracious and always sharing of your heart and your spirit with us. So thank you to everyone. Uh, thank, thank you, me. Selma. Thank you, Anne. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs>